This is Twit. You're here to, to talk about this this record this yeah. record launch. What happened, right? What happened with Aftershock too? <laughs> walk us walk um, us through it. Kind of like uh, like Doctor Wren mentioned is it took them 15 years after the club was founded to launch Traveler Four, um, and the goal with that was like so far in 2004 actually i don't know if maybe ian was inspired by the go fast launch but in 2004 a group of uh like amateur hobbyists they were adults kind of all in their careers already they got together and launched a rocket called go fast to 380,000 feet uh space like the boundary of space the carmen line is like uh, like around 330,000 feet mm. um so yeah it took our club 15 years to to do that um and they launched to basically 340,000 feet with traveler 4 that was actually out of uh spaceport america in mm -hmm. new mexico we launched oh. all of these videos that you're showing right now like our smaller vehicles those are the ones that launch out of mojave got it, got it. um and then we get the bigger rockets in more <laughs> more remote locations basically um but yeah then after traveler 4 you know, the pandemic struck pretty soon after and we wanted to go back as soon as we could. But then, you know, because the club relies on transfer of knowledge, we just needed to make sure because, you know, people are graduating. That's one of the main challenges with the club mm -hmm. is people are graduating. We wanted to do something bigger and better, but it just took us a bit of, you know, honing our skills, passing on the knowledge, all those people who had been there. Um, for the time of Traveler 4, taught us everything they know. And then it took us like another five years, but we got there and it was like, so I mentioned Go Fast was 380,000 feet and Aftershock 2 went to 470,000 feet. Wow. And that's like, the, th those are the only three rockets by amateurs that have made it to space. So we think we crushed the record pretty well <laughs> so well almost that we don't know if we should attempt to beat it because it might go over the legal limit oh, hey no. and and they're beating virgin galactic and i think blue origin so that's pretty uh, impressive because yeah. <laughs> those guys have a little more money so dr Irwin, i have a question uh, oh and i wanted to mention you know it's comforting i was watching the video uh yesterday it was comforting to see that from your little inside camera that the nose cone came off to release a parachute, just like my rocket did before it slammed into those kids playing Little League, um, <laughs> oh, man. who just stood there with a shocked look on their faces. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, getting carried away. Um, it, it, it's unusual for a, a lab like this or a program like this to be run and, and staffed by undergrads, isn't it? This sounds kind of uh, kind of groundbreaking. Well, here's the thing. Uh, it's undergrads who have uh, time and motivation to do things that are kind of for glory or for their own purposes, as opposed mm -hmm. to grad students who are busy working for a, uh, typically a PhD thesis. And so grad students have a lot less uh, spare time. Now, undergrads, you have to realize that when they graduate and they go out into industry, the, the industry people interview them, and you can't really tell from somebody's grades how good they're gonna be. What you really wanna see is what they've actually done. So uh, students who have worked on hands-on student projects like Rocket Lab, there's a whole bunch more, by the way, in the School of Engineering, but, um, but the Rocket Lab is, is the, uh, perhaps the most famous now, but um, students who have worked in Rocket Lab and can show what they've done have kind of a, a golden ticket into industry. The, the experience is very, very valuable. And there are a lot of student groups that are, that are designed um, around national competitions. So USC has, for example, and the aero design team that that flies aircraft for a national competition run by the uh, Aeronautics and Astronautics Association, AIAA. Uh, and, but uh, RPL is unusual in that there's no specific competition. They were founded with the goal of being the first student group to get to space. And, and that they pursued the goal single-handedly all the, or single-mindedly all these years. So it isn't actually unusual like you think. In fact, it would be it would be more unusual if this were a grad student organization. Mm. Interesting. You know, I, I'm curious where um, or aftershock two lands up in the program's like achievements. You know, we, you you mentioned that you you passed the Carmeline. You 
kind of shattered it. I think you hit like 90 miles, which is crazy, right? <laughs> so um, that's actually higher than Blue Origin too, now that we think about it, uh, right? So, yeah. um, and, and and I think it's it's what, it's about 13 feet tall, 330 pounds, and then you, you were able to reach like what, 3,600 miles an hour or so, just, just over that. Yeah. Where, where does that line up, you know, in 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 the vehicle evolution i mean uh you know is is the, the the rocket just get bigger and bigger and that's what lets you get higher and faster is it lighter is it smarter how like where does it line up for the evolution there yeah so if you look actually at traveler 4 and aftershock 2 you know our two kind of biggest most successful rockets they have the exact same outer dimensions um meanwhile Aftershock 2 went like 1.4 times higher than uh, Traveler 4. And there's like, you know, there's a lot of things. It looks basically the same on the outside, but everything on the inside is essentially what allows it to go higher and some, you know, more thermal stuff on the outside. But, you know, we, we it's actually it used a completely new propellant that we formulated, uh, our club formulated, and, you know, we cast that propellant. It uses kind of... <laughs> we we kind of squeezed together all the rest of the systems so that we could fit more propellant in there. Huh. Um, and then we, you know, made everything lighter that we could. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's, we actually didn't work entirely by making the rocket bigger. It was mostly by optimizing things because we actually have like a kind of limit on how big we can make things just based on the infrastructure we have in our lab space. Um, and actually in the future, we're considering <laughs> making our rockets smaller, uh, but still achieving the same height. So we'll see how that goes. So one of the problems I had in my, my brief and, and uh, unimpressive career as an amateur rocketeer, like many, because there were no electronics involved at the time, because I'm old, was tracking the thing down downrange. You know, the parachute goes up, you lose sight of it, parachute pops, you kind of might to track it for a second and then it disappears and because i was doing this in southern california down orange county it was critical to find it quickly because they tended to start fires and of course we were always launching in the summer and whoosh and that did happen a couple of times though we put it out uh i yeah. assume you had some kind of radio tracker on this so you could uh go track it down yeah we have a lot of different tracking systems the the main ones that like were successful on this flight were gps based so they you know they talk to the satellites wherever they are on earth of course gps actually locks out if you're going so fast and so high because the government doesn't want people <laughs> using gps for uh, missiles or anything like that mm -hmm. so we're only able to get a gps data low to the ground which is important because you know that's where you want to find the rocket um and yeah it talks to the satellites and then radios buzz back that information as well so um, the satellites tell us, and then the 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 radios tell us. We have a system that tries to trilaterate the rocket. You know, basically from the launch point, we send a few groups of people out a, a few miles away, each mm -hmm. in different directions, so they can right. point radios, point antennas at the rocket, and based on you know the time that it takes for the signal to go to the rocket and come back, you can tell how much distance the radio signal traveled. And that way you can get a position on the rocket. It didn't work on this flight, unfortunately, but it's worked before. And we're, that's like one of the cooler things we're hoping to get working in the future for sure. See, so Tarek, like science. Of, I was going to say what happens like, when you know how to do math and you have like computers more advanced than those crummy calculators we had, they can <laughs> triangulate things. I was going to say, when I launched my Estes rockets, that's like the funnest part is just to go run after it. Most fun. I shouldn't say fun. That's not a word. <laughs> to to go run after it and try to catch it. Out of the air, but I guess something that's 330 pounds, you wouldn't want to be underneath that when it came back oh, no. to Earth. Um, you know, Dan, I'm curious. This launch, uh, this record-setting launch was on October 20th, and October is like the start of the school year. And that's when people are are just like getting their, their feet back uh, for, for, for academics and whatnot. And I'm curious how the program and, and like the students that, that you oversee, you know, uh, adapt to that schedule. I mean, is this something that's just always going on in the background that you have students uh, that you're overseeing like throughout the, the summer and the year, or is there like a really specific time where you have to get them into gear uh, 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 and uh, with like Ryan and, and, and the rest of the members uh, to go out, to, you know, to, to go out to Nevada and, and, and Black Rock to, to have everything ready. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, 
how you kind of wrangle those cats <laughs> to, to get to space uh, oh, when, you, when, when they, they have finals and everything else to worry about. You're, uh, you're acting as though I'm in charge of the students. Actually, the students are very self-motivated. Mm -hmm. they, they pretty much schedule their own, their own trips. But by the way, October is not the start of the school year for us. That's more of a UCLA thing because we start in August. So, <laughs> so by October, we're well, uh, we're, some of the students are taking midterms by that time. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't do much over the summer, by the way. The summer is kind of a downtime for the Rocket Lab because the students are all off doing their summer internships. So the, the lab tends to be fairly empty. But fall and spring semesters are when, when everything really happens. One year, they, they were a little late in their, in their launch work, and, and they, they actually did a launch during finals week. That was a really, oh my gosh. <laughs> that worked out very badly. Um, and we, we made a rule that that could never happen again. But in general, when students are going to go out, and by the way, this is a big group. I think, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think about 150 students attended this launch. Oh. Really? And, wow. uh, yeah, 130 came out here this time. Oh, I had a little, okay, I was a little overestimated, but still a pretty big group. Um, and mm -hmm. um, they have to miss class because it isn't just a one-day trip. There's a, it's it's a long drive, plus they they camp, they set up, they're, it's a multi-day trip. The launch is actually on a, over the weekend, but they, uh, the earliest people leave in the early part of the week. So they miss a bunch of classes, and in some cases they had to miss midterms. So uh, part of my job is to, is to write to their professors and, and say, um, this is a USC thing. It's considered very important by the School of Engineering. Would you please do the extra work that it takes to give these students makeups or do something uh, to, to accommodate their, their missing the work? And the other professors in, are universally very nice about it because it is extra work. Mm -hmm. And, and they, mm -hmm. they gladly do it because they've, um, I don't know how it is for other clubs, but uh, Rocket Lab gets really good press. And, and I think all across the university, people have heard of it. So, so the students get a lot of leeway. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there.